First, briefly, kind of who's who on Admiral John S. McCain. Present duty, Navy Chief of Information of the Pentagon, born in Council Bus, Iowa, graduated from the Naval Academy, Ensign, 1931, first duty battleship, the Oklahoma. Went into submarines in 1933, commanded the submarine Gunnel in 1942 until 44. Took her off French Morocco before the D-Day bombardment, photographed the beachhead, took her to the Pacific, sank a Japanese destroyer, damaged considerable Japanese shipping, and given the Silver Star, Bronze Star, various other medals. Had a number of commands since the war, including submarine divisions, the cruiser Albany, the amphibious training command, Atlantic Fleet. Admiral Clint McC McCain, you've had an unusually well-rounded Navy career, as, as I read it, submarines, cruisers, amphibious ships, and now the Pentagon. With this experience behind you, what would you say about the importance of leadership in the Navy? As with every other profession in life, Leadership is the single most important factor as far as achievement, success, and the completion of a job to be done. Uh, you can buy many things in life, but you cannot buy leadership. And there are certain simple rules that go with leadership. As you and I know, there have been great volumes written on this subject. And it's very rare in my naval career that I have ever heard it expressed simply, but the fundamental fact of leadership rotates around the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, your job uh, is to get the Navy story across to the public. I wonder if you could give us some examples of outstanding leadership you've perhaps seen in this assignment. Uh, <clears throat> from the standpoint of leadership, you might say there are two facets to it. One, which is our physical examples, and second, which are the intangible results of just the actions that somebody in a position of high command takes. And one thing that uh, people are very apt to forget is that the actions that a petty officer or an officer takes in a particular situation, it may be apparent to him the reaction of the individual standing in front of him as he takes this action. But what is not apparent to him is how far-reaching the effect of what he has done may have through a wide spectrum of uh, individuals who either hear about this or have seen the results of some action that he takes. Now, in the business of uh, the uh, propagation of sea power, uh, the foundation of any ship is the man. And this is very apt to be forgotten in this so-called atomic age, space age, or missile age. And I can assure you, if the Blue Jacket on the forecastle of the ship at sea doesn't do his job, it makes no difference what sort of brains, technical knowledge, scientific know-how is superimposed on that. It all comes to naught unless you have somebody who knows how to tell this Blue Jacket what to do. And this is exemplified every day in the fleet when you're at sea working with these men. Well, Admiral McCain, you say that leadership is simple, and I agree, but at the same time, it's a very elusive thing. How do you, how do you teach something that, that intangible? I didn't mean to make the statement that leadership is simple. Uh, what I meant to say was that uh, in my naval career, I have never heard it simply expressed. Uh, I think with leadership, as with other facets of living, you have to establish certain ground rules from which you operate into the more complex atmosphere of the leadership problem itself. Now, uh, again, I go back to this point because I think it is so that there's a great tendency in this mechanical age to forget this, that, to forget all about this man. And again, I want to repeat, you can buy many things in life, but you cannot buy this. Now, Voltaire once made the statement that each one finds his own, each man finds his own way to heaven. Uh, this same statement applies leadership because there are many different methods by which leadership can be applied with equally outstanding results. Each man has to find his own way in this maze of principles and rules that apply to leadership and in his dealings with individuals. And probably, you, aside from this golden rule factor that I just mentioned to you, another one is you've got to be strictly natural, honest, forthright, and forward. There is no better evaluator of an officer than a division of Blue Jackets as he stands up in front of them and gives them orders. And then in your concept, le leadership is not simply a matter of being tough. Absolutely not. You've got to be firm, you've got to be fair, you've got to be uh, just, and you've got to also have a sense of humor. And furthermore, you have got to have a tolerance for the failings of individuals because all of us have them. 
And I think this is a very fundamental fact in living anyway, it's outside the realm of leadership. We've been talking about sea power. You're a great exponent of sea power, Admiral McCain. How does leadership fit into your concept of sea power? Uh, very strongly. Uh, in the first place, in order for an individual to perform his job well, he must know what the ultimate goal is. And this is what a sound policy, doctrine, or philosophy, whatever you want to refer to it as, of sea power does. Now, in the Amphibious Training Command, I have spoken to thousands and thousands of trainees going through, and this includes enlisted men and officers from all of the services. I went aboard all of the ships that went through training down there and talked to the crews of those ships, and on many occasions, I've had chief petty officers and petty officers first class come up and tell me, after having once listened to this, that never again were they going to complain about a deployment to the Mediterranean. And this is one of the finest examples I know of, of the need for educating every last officer and enlisted man that we have in the Naval Service, be he aviator, amphibian, surface ship, ASW, or submariner, on the overall objectives and how this team fits in together in its particular advancement towards the goal, which is the security of this nation in the years to come. Admiral, how do you spot a leader when you look at the number of men before you? Some are outstanding. What do you look for? Uh, that is a uh, uh, very, very difficult question to answer. I, uh, uh, personally, I've never been in the enviable position where I, that I've looked at on some individuals who can definitively answer a question like that. I can't do it myself, and some of it has to be done by trial and error, and uh, uh, some of it, uh, of course, you intuitively sense in a man who's got these qualities uh, there are certain things which he must have that are visible to anybody, and that's a neat appearance. He's got to, uh, if I uh, have a, uh, I don't know exactly how to express this, but his, his whole attitude has got to be one of uh, can-do spirit, uh, a one wanting to learn, a one who uh, takes pride in his own personal uh, attitude in the world, and you can expect for him to demand that of the people working under his particular uh, surveillance. It's a kind of a motivation, isn't it? Absolutely. It's a motivation down in the finest sense. What are you doing, sir, as chief of information to emphasize leadership in the Navy? Uh, first, let me explain. I've had this job for just about two and a half months. In the first place, I'm learning myself to a great extent in uh, this game, which I find to be, incidentally, most interesting, and uh, there's never a dull moment in it. But uh, in leadership, I hope, by working through the Bureau of Naval Personnel, to work ultimately into the entire program of the Navy, these concepts of sea power as the standard to which people can rally in the ultimate solution to the various problems with which they may be faced. Uh, would you have any advice uh, to a young man who just uh, starting his naval career? Yes. Uh, at the uh, Amphibious Training Command, we ran three schools under the aegis of Command of the Amphibious Force at Land. The first was a commanding officer seminar that was just for one day, and the real purpose of that is when we'd have a number of ships in port were to get the skippers together so they could sit down and exchange views and also bring them up to date on any important changes in policy. The second we ran lasted for a week, which comprised ensigns and lieutenant junior grade officers. And the primary purpose of that course, and it lasted uh, a week to two weeks, was to try to pass on to some of these young officers stepping into this field brand new to them, some of the principles of leadership, which we felt were absolutely essential in the education of any uh, man of that age. Then we had a six weeks course, which was a petty officer's leadership course, in which we took chief petty officers and petty officers first class and ran them through this. Now, in each one of these courses, I always made the initial address and I always made the concluding address. And uh, speaking to the junior officer now, one of the points that I always made to these young officers coming along is don't ever be afraid to take advice and I think that quite a few people miss this. And uh, furthermore, that I personally, in command of a ship, if an apprentice seaman on the forecastle tells me, Captain, there's something up ahead, I stop the ship and find out. And I have no sense of false pride involved in this thing. This comes with a thing called 
humility and an understanding of the problem as a whole. And perhaps one of the most difficult things to do is to maintain open channels of communications between yourself and your subordinates so that they are free to warn you when the ship is in danger, uh, literally and figuratively speaking. Another point I made to him, of course, is this thing, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, because if you sit down and reflect on that principle for a few minutes, uh, it encompasses a wide spectrum. If you want the man to shine his shoes, you shine your shoes. If you want the man to go out and do some job that's disagreeable, you do the same job too. In effect, you're ready to do it. You don't necessarily have to do this practically, see. But uh, these are some of the points involved in the thing. Now, another point with junior officers is that I go back to the days when I was an ensign aboard the Oklahoma. And there was a bosun's mate first on that ship who was a perfectly magnificent character. He was six foot four in height and he had a great big handlebar mustache and all of the color that goes with what you read about in storybooks of people to go to see. And for some period of time, I deluded myself into feeling I was giving this man orders. Looking back on it now, he was carefully training me uh, in my initial stages of injection into the Naval Service itself, and I have always been indebted to this particular individual. And he had all of these fine characteristics that go with a man that caused the people below him to follow him right on into death. He was a leader. Absolutely, in every sense of the word. So the point that I tried to get across to these junior officers, and this is a very difficult proposition, while maintaining a position as an officer and one in command, at the same time, you must learn to listen to these people as to what's going on and take their advice when the time comes to do it. And there's a very fine balance this thing, because if you go too far one way, then you find yourself no longer in command. If you go too far in the other direction, you find yourself in a position where you're operating from inexperience and not taking the full benefit of the experience that these men have. Admiral McCain, I'll take your advice any day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. This is the end.